going big on God. We can talk about this theme until it comes out of our ears. But nothing changes until you determine to start going big on God yourself. The problem is we can't get into the kind of relationship with God we want on our own. That's why we need the person and the ministry, the influence, the teaching of the Holy Spirit. He is absolutely key to who we are and what we are. Problem is, the problem is, we all have a theology of the Holy Spirit. Why is that a problem? Because we don't know where you got it. Very little of what we think we understand of the Holy Spirit actually comes out of the Bible. It comes out of our tradition. It comes out of our experience. It comes out of the snippets we've picked up here and there. You need to understand that when you engage him, you're engaging him who literally took the dead, broken, lifeless body of Jesus and resurrected it. And then Paul says it's that same spirit that did that that now dwells in you. Jesus also said that when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you all things. He will teach you all things. He will make all things known to you. He also said that when he comes, he will take from what is mine and make it known to you. So he doesn't even speak on his own authority. He speaks from the Father. Not only that, but John, the disciple of Jesus, says in 1 John chapter 2 that the, the Holy Spirit is an anointing that lives in you that teaches you all things. So he's incredible, but can I say this quickly? He's not safe. As a matter of fact, when the Holy Spirit was working through the ministry of Jesus, the onlookers, the religious experts, of which there are some in this church, who looked at the work of Jesus by the Holy Spirit, said, you're doing this by the power of Satan, it's another spirit. To which Jesus began to teach on the blasphemy of the Spirit. Taking the power and activity of God that you can't label or handle and giving it to the enemy. The Holy Spirit is incredible. And we need Him in our lives. To touch God requires a fellowship with the Holy Spirit that's real and authentic. It starts where? Where does a relationship with the Holy Spirit start? Does it start with someone putting their hands on you and praying for you? Does it start with you speaking in tongues? Those are all real. Those are all valid. Those are all legit. But relationship with the Holy Spirit starts in the place of prayer. It starts with you and I learning how to engage Him. Isn't it interesting? That when Jesus spoke about the very first coming of the Spirit, He said to them, Wait until you receive power from on high. Hardly any of us are good waiters. Some of you would say, No, I am. No, you're a procrastinator. That's different to a waiter. A Christian band once sang a song and had this line in it. They said, So hurry up and wait upon the Lord. Waiting upon the Lord is an incredibly active, engaged format. It starts in the real place of prayer, devoid of the ritual and tradition so many of us have picked up along the way. I remember some time ago, many years ago, there was a man who joined our prayer meetings and started to pray. And when he would pray, it's our Lord and our God. Thank you, Lord, for And people stream to me often and say, that man can pray. We must all pray like him. Now, obviously, he comes from a denomination. And some of you, having just heard my words, know exactly which denomination he comes from because that's how they all pray. But if you don't know that and you've never been in the place of prayer, like, oh, that's prayer. I remember there was a church building I wanted to look at getting a while ago. Huge facility. So I went to speak to the moderator of the denomination because no one's using the building. Seats thousands of people. So I went to have a meeting with him. With a few titles behind his name. In front of his name, sorry. A whole lot of them. So we went to, I went to see him. And in the discussion, 
I didn't get anywhere. He kind of bulleted me. He said, that's not going to happen. So I said, okay. He says to me, can we close in prayer? I said, sure. And we've had tea, coffee. We've laughed. We've joked. We've talked about the Lions, who won yesterday. We've talked about the Springboks. We've talked about ministry. We've talked about God. It was a great conversation. Then it ended with him saying to me, can we pray together? I said, yes. Stood up, and there it started. He took my hands. He started a shake. And I'm already thinking, Chutz, where is this guy? <laughs> then he started. Once a father and the yammer. Once a donkey. And, about, and then afterwards he said, okay, good to see you. See you again next time. Sat down. You see, you've got to understand that certain, we have adopted a ritual or a tradition that we think is prayer. Prayer, walking with the Holy Spirit, is a journey of discovery. It's rewarding, it's challenging, it's demanding, it's very fruitful. Prayer is one of the aspects of Christianity that is caught rather than taught. Even when the disciples of Jesus came to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray, he didn't. He told them what to say. He gave them content, but the how he left to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Jesus agonized in the garden. Then says to his disciples, on three occasions, could you not wait for me an hour? Three hours, he agonized in the garden. The Bible tells us he prayed one sentence in three hours. How do some of you cope with that who can't shut up in a prayer meeting? One sentence in three hours. Father, if at all possible, take this cup from me. The rest is a commune from spirit to spirit. Some of us don't know how to pray. Jesus, when trying to help his disciples understand the dynamic of prayer. Throw something in where there's, there's a whole lot of factors that need to be brought into account at the same time. One of which is you need to know who you're praying to. I'm going to talk about this next week. You need to know who you're praying to. You need to know that you're able to pray. You need to ask this question, why does God even hear my prayers? Who says he's going to answer them? I'm going to deal with all of that next week. But it all comes in the nature of this request that you're going to hear right now. So Jesus goes to his disciples and he wants to help them on how to learn to access God, to receive in prayer what they need to pray. So Matthew chapter 7, if you have your Bibles open. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. The one who knocks, it will be opened. Or, which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if you ask for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So then Jesus, in this context of Matthew 7, is saying, there's a way to acquire and then you need to understand that you have a good father in heaven who wants to give good gifts. Now I'm going to read in a moment the passage in Luke. And in the passage in Luke describes the exact same thing. In fact, let's just go there. Luke 11 verse 9. I want to read it. Luke 11 9. And I tell you, ask, it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. The one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent, or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, listen to this, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? When Jesus tells you that the father will give the Holy Spirit to you, he is telling you that you are on the verge of good things. Because the Holy Spirit brings good things. Because he brings it from the heart of the Father. And he brings it to us. Good things. He's a good Father. Talk about that maybe next time. We need to be convinced he answers in a good way. Even if his good way doesn't suit us. God's not a good Father when he gives you everything you want. Whenever you want it. God's a good Father when he gives you what you want when you need. If one of my three sons comes to me and says, Can I have 15 donuts? And I said, Only have one. I'm being a good Father, not a bad Father. According to him, I'm being a particularly evil father because they, we have 15. So why can't he just eat 15? I'm actually being selfish because maybe I want them for myself. Maybe I have other children I haven't told them about. 
and I'm going to give it to them instead. All these little thoughts that go through his mind, that he's unloved and uncared for because he only got one donut. We need to understand that our Father in heaven gives us good gifts. And interestingly, when Jesus started off teaching us to pray, the very first things he said was, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy king, sorry, thy kingdom come. The next line hurts. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, what's he trying to tell us? When he, the Holy Spirit, comes, who will give you good things, I want you to understand he's going to hear from me and give to you. So he's going to come and bring the kingdom of heaven and the will of the Father first. And he's going to bring that to bear in your life. Very first thing he's going to do. So his agenda and yours may clash from time to time. But he comes to... Now, behind this passage is actually a whole lot of theology that's going on. When you understand, I want to go big on God. I want to get out of just the realm of, of, of emotional need. I want to get into a place where, where I'm hearing God. I want to get into a place where God's will is being done in my life. I hope that's what you're praying. Otherwise, why are you praying? Because if you were just saying, Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, well, you may not receive everything that you want. But Jesus is telling us something that we need to hear very, very carefully. He's actually telling us that when we pray, we're putting ourselves in a place where we're not even primarily there to get what we want answered. We're there as blood-bought children of God to ask this one question. What do you want? We don't hear that in the church today. So let me, before I even continue with those verses, I'll probably get to next week, let me throw in a couple of other thoughts quickly. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 18. God is talking to Jeremiah around the false prophets that were trying to hear God for Israel. And in Jeremiah 23, verse 18, it says these words, But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or hear his word? Keep the scripture on there. Do you see the word counsel there? C-O-U-N-C-I-L. Not counsel as in advice. S-E-L. It's the C-O-U-N-C-I-L. Thank you. In other words, there is a council, a committee. There is a meeting of persons, the Bible's trying to describe. It is the language of a group of friends in close consultation. Which of them has stood in the council, the meeting, the group of close friends, the Holy Trinity that we call the Lord? Who has stood in his council to see or hear his word? Verse 22 carries on. But if they, those false prophets, if they had stood in my council, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned them from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. God was even saying that about those false prophets, if they'd even bothered to come and meet with, if they'd sought the counsel of heaven, they would have heard some stuff that they could have given to God's people. But instead, if you read through that passage in Jeremiah 23, they're declaring peace, 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 when there's no peace. We get a hint that God is saying the place of prayer actually starts with you and I being invited into a council meeting. We're being invited into the very council of heaven where God is planning, where God is wanting to minister to others. You find that in Genesis 126, let us make man in our image. God is having a consultation with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they're having a consultation around us. And then he announces, let us Make man in our image. There's this counsel in heaven. And then you see from Jeremiah 23 that when God counsels in heaven, he doesn't want it to be a secret. He's particularly bringing words out because he wants to disclose them. And so, so often when we're praying, it's like, my prayers aren't getting answered. I'm asking for this and this and this and this and this and none of it's happening. But God says, because you, we're not in consultation. You're just coming to me about what you want. You don't even know that there are councils in heaven. You don't even know that God is wanting to speak from heaven to you, but not just for you. You haven't even crossed over to the fact that you're a servant of the Lord. You're still in the place where I got saved to get out of hell and into heaven, and I got saved because this was a very good career change. I don't want to burn, so I'm coming to you. And by the way, now that you've got me, he has the further list of things I want. And by the way, because I'm such a mature Christian, if I don't get what I want, I'm leaving this thing. 
How many of us are there? I, I, I don't pray anymore because, because God doesn't answer my prayers. Do you really want to go to the other place? We are selfish, snotty little children. We can't even engage in the primary activity of a Christian, which is to pray. Because we don't know how. We don't know that there are councils in heaven where God wants to speak and minister to us. That's why Jesus, in such easy language, said to his disciples, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will make plain to you. He'll speak from me. It's very basic language. Leaning into the Old Testament, understanding that there is counsel in heaven. God doesn't arbitrarily decide things for your life. He wants to minister to you and through you. He wants to share with you his plans. Then we read in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. So listen, he has saved us and called us to a holy. Holy means a set-apart life. And not only has he called you and I to a set-apart life, but before time began, in grace, he gave the provision for everything he's going to call you to. Everything he's going to want from you. Every relationship, every hassle, everything you're going to go through, he says, I've already provided before you were born in the councils of heaven. I made provision for you to be successful at what I call you to. So the very first thing you've got to do is you've got to learn to hear me by my spirit. Then you've got to believe that I've already accessed for you what you need by my spirit. You won't be on your own. We need to learn how to access that grace. Then you read from Isaiah. I'll jump another third step now. From Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. Remember the greatest setup in the whole Bible. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. You know that well-known passage. There are cherubim and seraphim and creatures with all sorts of different faces standing before the throne. There are angels in multitude. There is God himself. And there's Isaiah in a vision. He looks around. And he's the only human in the room. The only one. And God gives this pronouncement, who will go for us? Now, no cherubim or seraphim or angel can go. So Isaiah looks around and realizes, it's me. So how did he respond? Here am I. You invite me to a place as the only human in the room. Then say you need someone to go and speak for. You can only be a human. I'm the only one invited. You're looking at me in the face saying, uh, who's going to go for us? <laughs> so in tremendous wisdom, Isaiah says, okay, well, here I am. I'm, in, I'm, I'm here. Send me. And off he goes. So the first thing you've got to understand is that God wants to invite you into his counsel. In the place of prayer, as you meditate, as you pray, as you worship Him. Place of counsel. When you go into the place of counsel, God reminds you, for what He's called you to, He's already provided. He's already provided. Then He asks the key question, number three, will you go? When you come to pray, are you prepared to go and do something with what you've received? Then He closes off with a story. Because he's saying this, I don't want to leave you out if you want to be included. And he closes off with this story, Matthew 21, verse 28. Jesus says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but didn't go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? So there are those often in the place of prayer who have had all those three stages. Then they get to the fourth stage and he says, okay, will you go for me? They come out of their devotion. Yes. Nothing happens. Then you get those who are so shaken up, but later on they still decide, and say, okay, I'd better go and do it. And they do go. Obviously the best answer is the son who says who will go and actually goes. 
So you see, prayer is that in, it, it's an environment where if I want to go big on God, the first thing I need to realize is, as someone put on Facebook or on Instagram the other day, I saw this great thing. One day when they discover the center of the universe and discover it isn't you, some people are going to be very disappointed. Because what's going to happen is in the place of prayer, you see, God gives the counsels that's concerning heaven right now. And that's why when you go into the place of prayer, you, you take all your agendas, you move it aside. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I come, Lord, with a clear objective today. I just want to be with you. And so that heart swings where it says, actually, I'm here to do the will of God. I'm here to find the will of God. Even if I don't need to do anything more than simply pray and agree with the will of God, I will just do that. There's tremendous power in words. And so he invites us into that space. He says, I want you to learn to come to me. Come pray. Not only that, but when you start to pray, you need to understand that I will invite you into stuff for which I've provided a solution. I'm not going to get you to pray aimlessly. I will provide a solution. Then once I've shown you my counsel, and I'll show you that I alone provide the solutions, I'm going to invite you to participate with me. Here am I, send me. Then I'm going to ask you to choose to go into the vineyard and do the work. That are, that, those are four very simple basics around the subject of prayer. But I need you to understand, it starts off with these incredible words there in Matthew. Ask. Seek. Knock. We don't do that very easily. Some of us get frustrated if nothing happens in five minutes. We don't understand the nature of God. I mean, if a young man wants to ask his father something, he'll pattern his request on the nature and temperament of his father. If you've got a dad who's ill-tempered and stingy, you're not going to ask for very much. And when you do go, you're going to go in the nicest, politest, most unobjectionable way without wanting to call his offense. Say, and say oh, Dad, uh, Father, would you mind, is it at all possible if maybe? But if you know that your father is good-natured and generous, aren't you going to go and present your needs openly, bravely, courageously? I know my kids, that's one of my things. They often interrupt me when I'm on the phone. And I'm talking to someone. And they come and say, you're always on the phone. Say, yes, I have a job. Can I have this? Boy, just wait. Oh, no, yeah, no, no. I want this. You see, they do it because they know they're not going to get smashed for it. They know they can access daddy and mommy. They know there is a freedom. You should know that your father delights to hear you. But he does want you to ask. He does want you to seek. and He does want you to knock. I remember years ago. This didn't exist. There was a tree over here. This was a park. We were in the children's church room. That was our church. And I went to preach in Italy, in Rome. And the, the night before I leave, I'm sitting on my bed because I don't want to go out and talk to the people because they don't speak English. And I don't speak Italian. And the mother is the only one who can interpret for all of us, and she was out. So we all suddenly smile at each other. I've had done that for three, four days now. I've had it. So I'm just hiding in my room with the door closed. So I thought I might as well pray. So I started spending time with the Lord, and the Lord says to me, I want you to go back, and I want you to build a children's church building. That's now the salvation room over there. I want, to, I want you to build that. It's five by ten. I said, but Lord, we're renting this property from a denomination, and church denomination, and, and I can't put a fixed thing on there. And while I'm talking to the Lord, he says to me, go and do what I told you, because this is your inheritance. So I get home. This was on a Tuesday night. So I fly home Wednesday. Sunday I'm preaching over here. And in my sermon, I, one of the things I said was, do you understand, I said to the church, that we need to own this property as part of our inheritance? I want to put a children's church block on. I want to do certain things, but we're renting here. We even need to trust God to own this as part of our inheritance. Ended the meeting, closed the door. We, I mean, closed the meeting. I'm standing outside, and one of the elders comes to me with one of the others, shaking with a, with a, with a, with a check. He, and he gives it to me, and I count the notes. 16 or what, 18 years ago, no, 20 years ago, almost, 250,000 rand. What's that worth today? It was a bank guarantee check. What had happened that no one knew was we as elders had gone and prayed and asked God, how much should we offer for this property? Toby, you'll remember this because you sat in on those meetings. 
We asked God. We had a prayer meeting. We sought the counsel of heaven. And we asked God, how much do we pray for? What do we need, Lord? All of us, all three or four of us received the exact same figure we brought to the table. 250,000 rand. All four of us. 250,000 rand. Without telling a soul in the church, the amount deposited, 250,000 rand, on the head, as an anonymous bank guarantee check. We bought this property debt-free. Bang. First day. We bought it. We then, because it's a paid-off building, we need to insure the property. Then it was insured for 668,000 rand. Or 688,000. That's what it was worth. We got it for 250. The point was, we sought counsel. God spoke. I declared what I felt God had said. He provided. We went and purchased. It's a simple process. Years later, I'm in the, I'm in the, we bought the house across the road here. And I'm standing in the shower and I'm saying, Lord, shower is a wonderful place for revelation. Have you ever noticed? And I'm saying, Lord, there's people in our church with more than one car. Me and my wife, we've been married 14 years. We've got one car between us. Come on now. Can't you get someone to give us a car? Just another one, please, Lord, come on. I'm standing in the shower. The Lord speaks to me in the shower. And he says to me, do you really want that? I said, yes. I th- not even want that. I think I need it. So she says, okay, then ask me right now. I thought I just had, but I did. So I said, okay, this is what I'm asking for. I got out of the shower. Tuesday morning. Go to the elders meeting over here. And before we start the elders meeting, the elder in charge of the finances in those days says to me, Greg, sorry, before we start the meeting, do you know anything about 100,000 rand put in the church account for a car for you? I said, no. He said, yeah, it was put in last Friday with a message. So the whole deal had been done before God even moved my heart on the Tuesday of the week after. And the point I'm simply trying to make is when God wants to get us in the place, and I can tell you about how we got David. I could start to tell you stories, as I'm sure some of you could. But what I'm trying to say is that when we want to access, we want to go big on God for God's things. He will draw us into a place to hear his counsel by the Holy Spirit. He will show us the provision already provided for us by the Holy Spirit. He will invite us to participate by the Holy Spirit. He will then ask us to get into the harvest field and go to work by the Holy Spirit. And the problem is some of us don't respond because we aren't aware of the leading, the unction, the pulling of the Holy Spirit. And when we do see some of his activities, they so freak us out, we pull back and say we're scared of this. But I want to tell you very confidently as I close, you cannot go big on God until you embrace the fullness of the person of the Holy Spirit. And until you allow Him His rightful role, not to make you happy, but to hear from heaven, to minister to you and to minister through you. The Bible tells us that in the book of Daniel, The Daniel one time waiting for a prayer request from God had to wait 21 days for one single prayer to be answered. Some of us can't wait five minutes in the place of prayer and we're fed up and we've had it because we're not waiters. And I'll talk more about this next week, but there is a culture coming where we need to learn to ask, we need to learn to knock, and we need to learn to seek where we get aggressive in our posture in the place of prayer, saying, hang on, we're here on commission from God himself. And we are going to learn to pray until. We're going to learn to wait until. And it's not a passive lying back procrastinating. It is a getting in the counsel of heaven. Sometimes, that's why I said that, I will tell you that they will see and hear my word. Sometimes you don't even need to hear a word from God. Sometimes you just need to see the greatness of God to walk out of that prayer time with an assurance that He's got this thing. And then to start bringing that assuredness. And then you can start opening up and unpacking various scriptures around Moses whose face shone and etc., etc. Of when people have truly been with God. But I want to ask you very carefully to grow in your personal revelation of the Holy Spirit and allow Him to teach you from Scripture. That's why I said to you, take uh, 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 
John 14, take John 16, take 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to himself from his word. Be very careful that your understanding of the Holy Spirit doesn't come from a tradition where you're either so secessionist that they don't even believe in the Holy Spirit they're trying to preach about, or you are so liberal that the Holy Spirit is just this force that's there for your good. He is sent by God to be in you and with you forever to begin to bring you into the councils of heaven. For how many of us? All of us. Every single person in this room. That's why I didn't say, when you pray, you start with this, and you know the acts or the, or the different things, and you do this first, you do this second, you do this third, you do this fourth, you do this fifth. I do not believe in ritual and tradition when it comes to the place of prayer. I believe in an intimacy where the Spirit Himself will tell you how to pray, and He will minister to you, and He will bring you into the councils of heaven, and if you're anything like me, your devotions will be totally different each time. But you'll be engaging Him. And that's why you need a fairly chunky time of quiet time undisturbed because God wants to deal with you. You know, I pray when I drive my car. That's great. But what happens when God gives you a vision? (laughs) Yes. And you're in rush hour merely having your way and suddenly, whoop, you're in heaven and there's seraphim and cherubim and the next thing you're really there. (laughs) Right? You need to give God some chunky time where you just are. I tell you, you come out of those meetings, you know you've been with God. Your whole day has changed. Versus the one who said, oh, I didn't read my Bible today. I wonder if I'm going to have an accident on the way. I didn't plead the blood. Now, how many of us do that? Oh, I forgot to plead the blood. God's not going to care. Do you think God has these rituals that if you don't keep tough, He's with you always. He never leaves or forsakes you. The day you forgot to pray for your dog is not the day it gets bitten by a snake. He's got it. But he's inviting you to a place of revelation, a place of intimacy with him, going big on God. You will come out of heaven having seen and heard. The way you handle everything in front of you changes thereafter. And God equips you in your spirit for what you need. Stand with me, please.